Senior Research Development Officer for the uh, Research Commercialization and Outreach. Uh, his title today is Research Development, How to Turn Your Best Idea into a Career of Funded Research. So we're very happy to have Ron here. Please welcome Ron. Thank you. No applause is necessary. How to turn your best idea into a career for funded research. That's the basic pitch we're going to make today. How many of you are graduate students? How many are faculty of one form or another? Okay. All right. The, the, I, I took this, I took the approach here is basically for graduate students, okay? That's, that's, so there may be some very rudimentary uh, information here for all you professionals faculty types, but uh, I think it's a good thing to remind yourself of stuff every now and then. My name's Ron George. I'm the Senior Research Development Officer in the Office of Research Commercialization and Outreach at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi, which is where we all work. So, what's the big idea? You know, that's where it all starts. It starts with a big idea, okay? Little ideas are not competitive. You got to have a big one. It's your idea, though. And that's the, that's the foundation for all research development. The fundamental thing that has to occur before anything that happens in my office down the hall, no proposal. I'm not going to talk to you today about how to, how to make a funding proposal. Okay, we're not going to talk about money hardly at all because we're going to go way back in the train. We're going to talk about what it means to develop an idea into a research program into funded, a funded program. Funding comes to those who fill knowledge gaps. If your idea no matter how good you think it is, if your idea does not fill a gap in the knowledge base of your, of your field, in your profession, then move on to another idea. <laughs> because funding agencies, funding agencies want to fill knowledge gaps. So, how are you going to know whether your idea fills knowledge gaps? Oh, I forgot about that. Mediocre ideas don't compete. They just don't. I'm sorry. And, and, and everybody in this racket will tell you that. You know, if they're honest with you, you can't make a purse out of a silk purse out of a sow's ear. You've got to have a great idea. It fills a knowledge gap or you will not be funded. That's the magic word. Innovation, innovation, innovation. Your idea is going to be big and fat. And what else has got to happen with it? You got to be passionate about it. You know? How many times have you read in the history of science where everybody was pointing to the guy over in the corner saying, that's about the stupidest thing I ever heard of, you know? But he was right. He was right, and his big idea became the biggest gap filler of all, right? So you got to be passionate about your idea, especially when you know it's not mediocre, especially when you know it's going to fill a gap in the knowledge base. So it's got to be new. It's got to be new. And the people who give you money for your funded research know the difference between what is new and what is not. We're looking for new knowledge. New knowledge. We're looking for new methods. New methods. We're looking for new perspectives on the knowledge base. Okay, so research development begins with an idea that fills a knowledge gap. How do you know whether your idea has already been baked? How many of you are writing a dissertation? How many of you have written a dissertation? <laughs> How many of you are writing a thesis? Okay. What do you got to do in order to get your committee to say, OK, we'd like you to write your dissertation on that subject? You've got to do your lit review. Research development begins with investigation, with research. You've got to know whether your idea is going to carry water. If it doesn't carry water according to the lit review, then you can go back and have another idea. Do something else. The bottom line, <laughs> get it? <laughs> Get it? The bottom 
<laughs> Look, I'm not getting paid a whole lot for this. So when I tell a joke, you must laugh. Okay. The bottom line is find your niche. Find your <laughs> That is funny, isn't it? <laughs> oh, boy, pretty easy for him to say. He's not a faculty member. <laughs> find your niche. Find your niche. That's the whole point in there of the foundation for research development. Now, I have a phrase that I call the conceptual white, white paper. Some of you are early career faculty who have just finished four, five, six years, seven years of research and hard work and it's called a dissertation and this is basically your conceptual, this is my conceptual base. This is what I'm going to spend my life doing is continuing my research in my chosen field and I'm going to go out and change the world based on this wonderful research I did for my dissertation. Well, that's fine. Except when you're working with your research development office, please do not send me your dissertation. I gotta have a two pager. I gotta have two pages with no more than 1100 words in my files that will basically tell me what your concept is and your trajectory over the next five or ten years. This is what I'm going to be doing in research for the next five or ten years. Whether you're in the science, whether you're in over there in science and engineering, or whether you're in liberal arts, whether you're in the business school, if I know in 1100 words or less what your plan is, then I can start relating to you in terms of how to get your plan funded. Okay? Now, you may decide that, yeah, it's more like a strategic plan than a funding proposal. In fact, it's not a funding proposal at all. It's where your idea is, is refined into something that you can explain to me in 1,100 words or less. And remember, it's got to be in my kind of English. You know, <laughs> if, if you were writing, uh, gosh, I've read some really great stuff that I didn't understand. You know, and I have to say, look, we have to talk. I'm going to interview you, you're going to explain it to me, and then we're both going to agree on how it should be rewritten so that I can understand it. And that's okay. That's what I'm here for. But please, uh, it's not an abstract. <laughs> it's not a paper. It's not technical. It's in English. We're looking for that trajectory. Again, I want to repeat that. Over five or ten years, that way we can help you step by step by step get funding for it. It's always a work in progress. How many of you have had a great idea and then, saw, and then seen the publication the following month in your most favorite <laughs> professional journal that somebody's already been there, done that, and got the credit for it, okay? So maybe you have to start shuffling around a little bit. Your concept over time may change. Now, who are you gonna tell about that? Well, your colleagues, your spouse, perhaps. Uh, you're also going to tell your research development officer. Because if your concept has changed, if your trajectory has changed, and believe me, I'm working with a faculty member right now who's totally changed her research trajectory over the past year and a half. She's going back to school, going to learn another whole field so she can bring two fields together into some rather innovative research. Okay, but. I have to know that in order to help her get it done. So it's going to be subject to refinement, continuous revision, all right? Um, it's a great, you pursue your great idea through stages, right? <clears throat> okay, now we go from the big idea to research trajectory. Ideas worth pursuing are worth pursuing over time. That's another way of testing your idea. If this is going to fill a knowledge gap, that's great. Is it going to have value, impact over time, five to ten years from now in, in the field? Yes. So after we figure out your trajectory, right, your five to ten year, this is, I'm going to start here, I'm going to go there. Then we're going to start breaking that trajectory up into smaller steps, into little chunks. We're going to call them 
project one, project two, project three, <laughs> and we're going to break them up into little steps, and each step is going to be like a project toward filling the knowledge gap that you say your big idea is going to fill. Now in my view, if we've got the right idea, it's truly innovative, it's a big idea, not a mediocre idea, and you have a trajectory that's realistic, that, you, that you're capable of, we're going we're to take each of one of those steps and make it into a fundable project. We're going to find a way to get the dough so you can do this. Please, please, please. That's not the bottom line, because <laughs> there's no line under it. <laughs> you know, write this thing up for me. Give me a, a concept paper for your research trajectory. The more we know about that, the more it goes into our database, the more we can help you when we look at, at, fund, at new funding programs every day, we can say, ah, Brad Shope. Just the thing for his, for, his, for his program, for his next step, okay? And then Brad will submit a competitive proposal. He'll get the $500,000 grant that he's always been wanting, and everybody will be happy, right? I will be happy. For each one of those steps, we'd like to see a little tiny 500-word one-pager, project by project. This is what I'm going to, I'm going to do this first. It's going to be my preliminary data. Then I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to do this. And some of that may be, I need some funding to go to a conference and network with a bunch of my colleagues. You know, I mean, it's not just about gathering data. It's also about getting you out into your academic community so you can network with your colleagues, so you can make presentations and sit on panels and bring prestige to the university, which is part of research development. Okay, we want to enhance the the um, the image of the uni out there in the public. Why? Because we want to build our capacities. We want bigger and better. We want the best faculty to come here and teach. We want NSF to give us all the money we ask for for new equipment. You know. So the more we build up the reputation of the university, the better off we are. So we're going to have those one pages, about 600 words. How do you write these things? They're not, like I said before, it's not an abstract. It's not an article. It's not a term paper. It's written to sell. It's written to sell. I want someone, a program officer at NSF, for example, Rick, I want a program officer to read that document, that one pager, and say, whoa, that is really cool. And it's going to be written as a selling piece. You have to sell your ideas in this racket. You know, you may have the most wonderful idea ever there was in your field. And if you don't sell it, it ain't going to go anywhere. Okay? That's a hard fact of life, you know, because I grew up in academia and I thought, you know, someone ought to pu publish my book. You know why? Because it's the truth. Right? Mm -hmm. It's true. And it will illuminate all of Western civilization if everyone will read my book. So I'm just going to sit here and wait for some publisher to come and read my book <laughs> and read my draft, you know? Guess what? Uh-uh. <laughs> You got to get out there and beat the bushes and sell that book if you're going to get it published. Think of your one pager as an elevator speech. How many of you know what an elevator speech is? Rick knows what an elevator speech is. What is an elevator speech, Rick? You get in the elevator with the person you want to sell something to, and you have till the floor you get out on to sell it. Right. <laughs> you're going to the second floor. You're standing next to a guy who's got a billion dollars to invest in all kinds of projects. You're a student at MIT, for example, and they walk around there all the time looking for ideas, and everybody has a project, and everybody can explain it in about 90 seconds. You get in the elevator, you know the guy, you know the investor standing right next to you, you say, by the way, I've got a project, and you can sell that sucker, and people walk out of those elevators very many times with project, with funding. 
They even have an elevator speech contest at MIT. No kidding, they really do. I've seen it, it's on the internet. Google that sucker, it's fun. You know, people get out there and they stand up in front of a whole room full of people and they give that 90 second elevator speech. And it's a contest, everybody votes and they say, that one gave the best elevator speech, All right? So your one pager, it's a little longer than an elevator speech, but take the same approach. I want to be able to tell this person in no time at all what this project is about. I want to impress them with it so that they'll give me money. <clears throat> so now we come to the project summary. This is not the concept paper. This is the project summary. This is the selling piece. This is the thing you carry with you when you go to Washington. And you run into somebody in the hall at NSF. And you say, by the way, I'd like to show you something. All right? Project summary. Oh, by the way, <laughs> that's the bottom line on the top. I haven't said a word about funding yet. I've mentioned it several times, but I'm not talking about how to get it. This is all preliminary to writing proposals and doing all the hard work you have to do to do that. We'll do that, have that talk another time. Research development's about your ideas. A little recap here. Research development is preliminary to funded research projects. A lot of times people ask me what I do. You know, what do you do? <laughs> I've had people in my own office tell me that. <laughs> Ron, what the hell do you do? You know, you got pre-award, we got post-award, we got compliance down the hall, we got people who actually know what they're doing around here, and what do you do? Well, see, I back things up. I back things way up. We do things that are really preliminary to all of that administrative stuff, okay? And sometimes it works, doesn't it? Yeah. Right, Epley knows. Work for her. Research development is the process of continuous refinement and improvement. Successful investigator scholars are always in the process of research development. Always. There's no end to it. Bet you got into this academic game. Didn't know that, did you? <laughs> oh no, actually you probably did. But we like to remind you that, that it's always that that scholar academics are always in the process. Always in the process. I figure it this way. Most of us work 50 or 60 hours a week, give or take 10 or 20, right? Graduate students, faculty, administrative staff, we all, let's just say we work 60 hours a week. So you got three things to do when you're in, on the faculty. You got service, you got teaching, you got research. So you take away service, you take away teaching, you got about 20 hours a week you can spend on research. Now that doesn't mean you're going to spend 20 hours a week writing proposals. It doesn't mean you're going to spend 20 hours a week bearing down on the next proposal or, or doing your bookkeeping or anything like that or even administering. Sometimes you're just sitting around thinking about what comes next, but it's always going on. You know? Can you lock yourself in your office for an hour and a half a day? Oh, let's just say 45 minutes. And just think about what your, where your research is going and what you're going to do with it. Just think about it. The smartest people in Corpus Christi work here. Some of the best brains in this city, in this region, in this state are right here. And yet we, don't have to, we can't give them enough time to use their brains in order to come up with the ideas that result in fundable research. So, geez, you know. You got office hours. I have my office hours from 3 to 5. How about I've got think time from 3 to 3.45 every day. Think time. Close the door. Don't answer the phone. Turn off your cell phone. Turn off your computer and think. You'd be Well, you wouldn't be surprised because you know how to do that. Not sure of that. Huh? Here. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think that way too. It's not just about proposals. It's not just about proposals. However, here's the big however. Significant goal of research development is funding. 
because the university benefits from it, because you benefit from it, we all benefit from it. Great ideas are worth paying for. It's the American way. You know, that's where we live, folks, and that's what happens. If you've got a great idea, somebody's going to give you money for it. Smart, educated people do not work for free. <laughs> right? Why should you do re your research without getting paid for it? You know? Why should you cheat the university of the prestige and, frankly, the indirect cost that we're all going to receive when you get a $500,000 grant? Some of that money is yours. Some of that money is mine. Some of that money belongs to the president. But everybody benefits over time from funded research. <clears throat> Here we go again, the project summary. It arises out of the conceptual process, all right? The final one-page product for distribution. This is what you hand out. Now, I worked in an office once where our one-page summary, which went all over Washington, D.C., especially at the Office of Naval Research, it had pictures, it had graphs, it had color. It was really pretty. You can do that. Your summary doesn't have to be just a bunch of type on the page. If you need some help getting some layout, find a colleague who knows how to do that. Or do it yourself. Make it pretty. Um, don't overdo it. <laughs> okay, I had a, the boss I worked for where we made it pretty. The constant, my, see, I'm a, I'm a journalist. I know how to design publications. I know how to edit publications. And my boss didn't. <laughs> but she wanted it to be pretty. And she tried to make it too pretty. So you got you to gotta do it with a, with a touch of design sense and professionalism. But you can make it pretty. And it's, it, it, it's a more appealing document when you do. That goes without saying, doesn't it? Your project summary addre addresses a specific project, and this is what is in it. What will be done? Huh, no brainer. Why it will be done? Critical. Why do you want to take your time and my money to do this project? How will it be done? You got to tell them how you're going to do it. Right, Rick? This is, you know, don't lowball this, by the way. When, when somebody asks you how much this is going to cost, tell them. And then have the numbers to prove it. You know, you got to be able to tell them it's going to cost $50,000 no matter how you slice it. Okay. Show them the numbers. Show them the numbers. Don't lowball the thing. Don't work for free. Don't cheat yourself of your own time in this deal. Uh, I need four graduate students to do this project. How much does that cost? Mm, about 50 cents. No. Tell them the real cost. We have a little chart in the research development office that says how much a graduate student costs. Okay. So don't lowball the cost. Why it is significant. This will make or break your proposal. All the other things can be right, in, right on the money, and if you can't tell them why it's important, it won't fly. Long-term impact. Okay, in NSF they call it broader impacts. What are the broader impacts of this research? If we give you a million and a half dollars to do X, Y, and Z, what's that going to mean to your field, but also to society, to America, to the world at large. Ah, we're still on the project summary. Here's what it, I just told you what's in it. That's not an outline. That was just a content list. But here's what it looks like. Your first sentence has got to be a high impact lead. Now, I am not a scholar. <laughs> I'm a journalist. Can you imagine that? And yet, I was trained for 30 years as a journalist to do this, to write high-impact lead sentences. And if you need help doing this, come to me. We will work your project summary for you. We will make it a selling document. 
Okay? So this high impact lead sentence is a simple declarative sentence in the active voice. A simple declarative sentence in the active voice. Subject, verb, object, active voice. All right, that's the default sentence for everything you write. If you have to add stuff after that, fine. But have a reason for that. Start here on everything, but especially for your lead sentence. All right, 30 to 50 words, 35 to 50 words, and 50 words is pushing it. You have got to say everything. I prefer the 35 word lead. Okay, but I give, you know, sometimes you have names of things and long stuff that you have to say. And so 50 words is the absolute maximum for this first sentence. Count them. If it's 51 words, cut it. <laughs> you know? You say, how do I write a high impact lead sentence? I'm telling you, it can't be more than 50 words long. It focuses on significance and impact. Now please notice that that was not the first thing on the list of content. It focuses on significance and impact in the first 35 words of this, of this, of this summary. Here's an example. This project creates a research coordination network. Did you notice a simple declarative sentence in the active voice? project creates coordination network that will, for the first time, significance, engage South Texas community stakeholders and regional university scientists in constructive dialogue and public policy development based on an interdisciplinary investigations of environmental and energy sustainability issues in a semi-arid climate. Now, it can be shorter. It can be shorter, much shorter, actually. I think this one is 48 words. Maybe, no, not that long. I didn't count. But it's less than 50, and I can make it much shorter than this. But it's a good one, okay? The point is that you, you hit them between the eyes with this thing. You gotta hit them between the eyes. Now, then you go on, then you go on and, and uh, let's go on. Hello. Continue. Then you go to the background. First you slap them in the face. Then you pick them off of the net. Now, now let me explain. <laughs> you know. Ah! Got your attention. Okay. Now let me explain it to you. I'm going to give you the background. Why it will be done. There's your, there's your content sentence. The significance. Explain it for the first time. Well, that's, that's significant, but there's more to that. So you explain the significance. Then you go into your project description, how it will be done. No brainer. How much will it cost? Who are the personnel? I am the lead investigator on this, but I'm just an assistant professor at the Corpus Christi. I may need some colleagues in on this, to add some heft to the team. Because that's one of the things that agency, funding agencies look at. They want to look at, you know, is there any weight here? Is there any reputation here? That's why we need more and more reputation building at A&M Corpus Christi for our faculty. Because we need to bring some heft into these proposals. Okay? So who are the personnel? Who are the institutions? Notice the S. You don't have to limit yourself to collaborating with colleagues at AM Corpus Christi. In fact, depending on your field, agencies are kind of wanting you to reach out to other institutions, like our the research coordination network that I mentioned in that example. We have one here, and we it's a regional network of South Texas institutions, goes all the way to the valley. And we're trying to figure out how to be each other's best friends when it comes to sustainability research. Okay. Tell them about the impact. What will be the immediate impact of this research? And what will be the long range impact of this research? In one form or another, the project summary that you write, now remember that we're not talking about a particular funding program yet. 
This is not a funding proje or project summary. This is your first step in your conceptual trajectory. Okay, that project summary probably will become the first page of your funding proposal. You might have to tweak it a little bit to fit the program, and that's okay. But you've already completed page one of your proposal when you've got a competitive, hard-hitting, selling document called a project summary. Please do not write it as an abstract. <laughs> I'm gonna repeat this again, I got to. It's not a term paper, it's not sh a short version of your dissertation. It's a separate kind of document altogether. It's a preliminary outline for almost any proposal you're gonna write. Go back and look at that outline I just gave you on what's in, a, what's in the summary. It's in almost every case. You're gonna be able to use your project summary as the headings for your proposal. Okay, the project description, you'll have about anywhere from 15 to 25 pages to describe it. You've already got your outline ready to go. Okay. We want to help you write this summary. Okay. When you have something like this that you want to tune up and make very competitive, our office will help you do that. Now you may bring me a project summary that's absolutely perfect. In which case I will say, you know what, you've done a damn good job here. We don't have a thing to add to this. <clears throat> I've been here for two years and that has never happened. And the reason it's never happened is, be is not because the folks who come for help don't know how to write, because they do. It's just that I know how to write better. <laughs> okay? That's why they hired me. That's why they pay me the big bucks. We can probably tune up your project summary so that it seems. You've probably written a good one already, but we're gonna make it a great one. That's our pitch, okay? That's what we want from you when you're ready to, after you've done all your preliminary work and you're thinking about your trajectory and got your concept all worked out and the steps that you want to take, then bring me a project summary that we can keep on file, that we can help you tune up, and we'll make it sing for you. And if we can't make it sing, it's because we don't, we've failed in our job, because that's job one for us. We also want a current version of whatever that project summary is. Research Development Office is not Research Administration. Research Development Office is very preliminary to all the, thing, all the bureaucratic things you have to do in order to file a proposal. We deal in knowledge. We deal in knowledge about your research interests. We deal in knowledge about your background. We deal in knowledge about your previous funding. We deal in knowledge about where you want to go with your career. Okay, uh, so that's why we need information. If we don't have information, we can't help you, all right? So project summary principles, they're designed to sell. Forget not that we are selling an idea in the project summary. They are not products of academic detachment. It is okay when you write your project summary to get worked up and to feel passionate and to take leaps of logic and to sell the idea. Put your fist in it. And if it's over the top, we'll, we'll help you fix it. Just get on it, you know? Be, we have a, I have a, a, a little sign right outside my door. I love this word, Spanish, the Spanish word, ganas, or passion, you know? That's our motto is we have a passion for research development. And I'm hiring a grant writer. <laughs> Yay! Okay. You're gonna have to persuade reviewers that the research is consistent with the goals of the agency. Now we're not, we haven't talked about that part of research development yet, and we don't have time to do it today. But part of your task when you're developing your research plan is when you find agencies that are the most likely funders for your project, you have to know where they're coming from. 
You have to study the previous grants they funded. You have to look at their strategic plan. You have to look at their goals and expectations for their, for their funding. You know, they all have goals, whether you're talking about the federal government or the state government or the private corp corporations and foundations. You have to know the agencies really well in order to ask them for money. You're going to persuade reviewers that research fills a knowledge gap. Notice you can't just say it does. You have to persuade them. The people who review your proposals are going to be experts in your field. If they see that you have forgotten something or omitted something, they will tell you that that has been forgotten or omitted. Now the good thing about that is they're going to give you a review. They may not fund your proposal, but they'll give you notes from the review. You take the notes, you go back, you fix it, you resubmit. Now that's another thing my office does. When you have funded, when you have submitted a proposal that isn't funded, bring it to us immediately so we can figure out how to resubmit it. We may, res we may resubmit it to the same program. We may find another program for it, one more suited to it. But we want to take your proposal work. And I tell you, the next time I talk to you may be about proposals. When you've gone to the trouble of drawing up a 50, 75 page proposal, you don't want that thing just to come back to you unfunded and just put it on the shelf. No, we're going to rework that baby until we get money from it. Okay? Do not be discouraged. The hit rate for NSF grants right now is less than 20%. So I'm telling you, we will resubmit. <laughs> We're going to have to persuade them that it's innovative in concept and execution. That's what they're looking for. We're going to have to persuade them in, the, in, in it that the principal investigator, that's you, and the team and the lead institution are capable of executing the research plan. They will look at your capacities and they'll say, well, this is a great idea. But I just don't think they've got the, the horsepower. Okay? And we're going to try to persuade them that we do. But if it comes back unfunded and it says we don't, we're going to have to rework that part of it and say, and show that we do. We have to persuade. It's a persuasive document. And that's it. Questions? Ah, 40 minutes. Just right. Um, Any questions? Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, is that PowerPoint available somewhere online? I think, uh, yes. If you want the PowerPoint, you're certainly welcome to it. There's also a video, I think. Yeah. Which will probably be 1995 plus tax. 1995. Yes. No, actually, all. The only, the only thing it's going to cost is. Oh, well, yeah. The dude for the video is a better proposal. Like you'll get the video absolutely free. It comes with the territory. Yeah. No, it, the, the PowerPoint will be available, and I presume the video will be, too. Cool. Awesome. <coughs> wow.